Well, first of all, thank you everyone for attending what is our, our 12th webinar now of the series since uh, since we started these way back in um, April, May. First of all, thanks for taking the time out, what I know is a very busy schedule uh, for everyone. And hopefully um, today you'll learn a little bit more about uh, about toilets generally and, and then the hygiene behind, uh, behind that as well. Um, do take advantage of the chat facility which you should see um, at the bottom of the screen or the top of the screen depending how you've got it set up and we will have uh, people available to uh, answer those chats. Uh, there's also a Q&A but the difference between the two the Q&A will stay there but, but by all means use either one the quest the Q&A or chat and we'll have somebody uh, available that can answer those uh, questions as you go through. So as I said my name is uh, Stephen Edwards I at the marketing for Closamat and um, I'm really uh, what I wanted to say first and foremost this is welcome but also to say that we're very much open and um, uh, I'm ready for business uh, and I know the various parts of the UK depending where you're from will have varying de um, degrees of uh, lockdown right now and um, our product specialists will be the main point of contact if you're an OT are um, available as always for remote assessments but also for on-site assessments, of which my colleague Robin will talk a little bit more about later. So without further ado, today is about World Toilet Day. Uh, and for us, as you can appreciate, it's a big day um, for us as the uh, UK's number one wash dry toilet manufacturer in the UK, as well as then distributor across the UK and, uh, and actually across Europe as well. And before we sort of kick off with the main part of the content, those who have been on uh, these webinars before will know and probably expect to see a, uh, a few uh, polls. So I've just got a few polls which I'd like to um, put in front of you. And the first one is what would be the best wash dry toilet? So if you could only choose one thing, what would, uh, what would you or your client want most from the best wash dry toilet possible? Don't just think about what you've perhaps got now. Um, but perhaps about things that you're going to you know what if we always if we had that that would be fantastic for us and our clients and if, if, there, if there's nothing on here do go to other and add it to the chat um, and, and, and do put that in there if you think well actually what I really want isn't one of these options then do put that on there that would be great I know there's a few to uh, to read through I will go through each one but hopefully uh, you'll find one that's relevant to yourself I think what's uh, what's clear already from the people that have responded is uh, a couple of uh, areas really. The more stylish modern look, more like a conventional toilet, which makes a lot of sense, and also compatible with all the top uh, shower chairs seem to be the ones that uh, most people are putting in. I'll just wait for a few more respondents, and then we'll, we'll carry on with the next one, but that's great. I really appreciate these. I, I know it's, um, I know you guys are here to learn and listen to uh, the OT service, but these are really, really useful for us to just sort of find out a bit more about your requirements uh, and making sure that we can uh, meet those requirements. Okay, still a few coming in. Okay. Okay, well, thanks for that. Really appreciate that. Uh, the next one is, um, and again, if, uh, this is a very simple one straightforward question have you heard of changing rooms changing places changing rooms a very uh, program i remember back in the 80s uh, changing rooms or um changing places sorry or hygiene rooms simple question yes or a no it could be one or it could be both brilliant really good response to this one nearly there great thanks for that and um, just just for your input i think sort of two-thirds of you have and a third of you haven't heard of of these um both speakers today will talk a little bit more about these um so those that haven't heard of it you'll, you'll get to hear about that brilliant thank you next one again about changing places for those two-thirds really that uh, did say that they had heard of it if you answered yes to the previous poll, what stage, if any, do you get involved in? So is it the initial specification right at the start? 
taking a client perhaps to one of the rooms to use or taking a client to one of the rooms just to show how um, how they do work or is it just to outline that these rooms are available away from the home so they might have the facilities at home but you let them know they're also available in certain uh, locations across the UK I mentioned before is it the whole process from specification to opening or is it sort of passing on to clients uh, who are perhaps interested um, to find out more or not really that involved um, so you, you might have heard of changing places and hygiene rooms but not really being involved in that uh, which again is, is very much a valid answer so again just a few a few more seconds on this i think what's uh, what's pretty clear on here there's a couple of uh, uh, a couple of areas which pretty much add up to the 100 percent, which is um, just an outline of where these rooms are so you're letting people know uh, that when they're away from home but actually the majority of you are not really involved in 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 the process um i'll just wait a few uh, few more seconds as we get the percentage up a bit just to give everybody a chance to to vote but of course for some of you it might not be relevant at all okay thank you for that just a couple more and then we'll uh, we'll crack on with the main content for today so warranty and service and maintenance. Um, when adding warranty or service and maintenance to your specification of a wash dry toilet, do you normally sort of specify a warranty only, which is limited uh, in in most cases to some parts of labor? Do you do the full cover service and maintenance, which would include the warranty? Neither because it's dealt with by a different team or don't really understand the difference between warranty and service. So I'll just launch this. So again, uh, when adding warranty or service and maintenance to your specification of a wash dry toilet, do you normally specify? So the ones that I've been through. Okay, so again, just a few seconds. I think what's, there's two really clear on here for me which is the majority of you either have the full cover service and maintenance which would include the warranty or actually neither because it's dealt with by a different team and, and it'd be good actually if anybody's on the chat just to say which team would normally deal with sort of the service and maintenance because it's nearly half of you have said that it would be good to sort of maybe just add that into the chat if you've got just a few seconds to type in which team would normally deal with sort of warranty or service maintenance contracts. Okay, I've just seen from one, the Home Improvement Agency. That's great, thank you for that. Yeah, again, similar answer from another one of you. Okay, pretty consistent actually, I think. It's uh, the Adaptions Team or Home Improvement Agency. So uh, brilliant, thanks for that. And keep those coming um, as I go through to the next one, if you do add to those, because again, that'll be really useful for us to understand who our contact is so we don't um, perhaps keep bugging the uh, occupational therapist with this with this area thank you for that i think that's plenty on that one okay only two more now um so service and warranty package i'm going to launch this one um, what would be the most important factor when choosing to cover the wash dry toilet against any problem so even if you're not directly involved in that which i know also, a lot of you have outlined that you're not what areas would be the most important factor so just to cover the parts and labor a complete cover cover the life of the person using it the cost including in the same in the dfg as robin will talk about later colleague from closet how you can include that 24-hour helpline emergency call outs this may be something you haven't got at the moment but maybe something you'd be interested in doing or getting i should say or um, the bottom ones that don't specify for maintenance and warranty. Okay, just as you're filling these out, keep them coming in. Um, we've got the complete cover, unlimited parts and labor being really important for people. And uh, we've also got uh, another one on here, which is the 24 hour helpline, emergency call outs. Uh, actually cross, cross the piece, another one, the cost added to the same DFG as the rest of the bathroom adaptions important. So those three I think are the really key ones 
um, for the people on the uh, on this webinar today. Brilliant, thanks for that. It's a really good response. And the final one, and I will let you go and uh, listen to the main part of the content today. So the final one is, what is the optimum period you would normally look for when selecting cover for your client's wash dry toilet? Would it be one year, one to three years, four years, five years, five to 10 or the life of the client? So again, just give you a couple more seconds on that one. I think looking through what's uh, clear on here, percentage wise is, is actually all at the top end in terms of number of years. So five years, five to 10, and the life of the clients are the three clear um, durations that you would want that cover for. Okay. That's brilliant. Well, thanks, thanks everybody for uh, sticking with us on those polls. That's, um, that's it from me. Um, I'd now sort of as I said, enjoy the rest of the session. Um, first of all, just to introduce the uh, presenters today, you'll be hearing from Samantha from the OT service uh, very soon. And she'll take you through the key parts of the learnings today. And then Robin Tuffley, our marketing manager, will take you through a brief tour of, of Closima and our products and services. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Samantha. Thank you. Thanks Stephen and hello everyone and thank you for joining us. Um, as said, I'm Samantha and I'm an occupational therapist and also on the webinar today is Kate Sheehan, my colleague and fellow occupational therapist from the OT service. So if you've got any questions, just add them to the chat or question and answer bit. So just a little bit about me, whilst my main role today is working within the OT service um, my career has luckily spanned many settings and many of those have also been overseas in particularly low or middle income countries with a substantial amount of my time living and working as an occupational therapist in Uganda. So as we work through today's learning outcomes I'm going to be sharing some of my examples of practice both from the UK but also some international examples really taken on board today being World Toilet Day. Um, I think on a personal level that broadness of my practice has enabled me often to step back from day-to-day -day practice. We often get caught up in the day-to-day -day goings on and really what I wanted to achieve with the learning outcomes today was to take us back to our roots a little bit as occupational therapists. Um, often, you know, and quite rightly, day to day, we get centred around the person or persons we're working with. We get into our intervention approaches, the biome biomechanical approach, adaptations, cognitive behavioural approaches. And sometimes it's just useful to step back and go right back to our underpinning um, theory of occupational therapy and some of the things that we might not have visited for a long time but hopefully are what is the core of what we do so therefore exploring our understanding of occupational science and then lastly Robin will um, close with some more information about Clozomat. So honestly before this webinar was advertised were we aware that there was such a thing as World Toilet Day? And there's a hashtag for the day, so if you are interested in more things that are happening around the world, follow the hashtag on social media. But World Toilet Day now has been an annual event since 2013, but it was first started in 2001 by the World Toilet Organisation. Every year it has a theme. Um, this year's theme is sustainable sanitation and climate change and it's now coordinated more about the, by the United Nations. So World Toilet Day aims to celebrate toilets and raise awareness of the 4.2 billion people living without access to safely managed sanitation. It's about taking action to tackle the global sanitation crisis 
and achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number six, water and sanitation for all by 2030. Obviously this goal, like all 17 of the SDGs, are interrelated and achieving progress in one goal hopefully leads to progress in others too. So for example, if we achieve goal six, water and sanitation for all, we also work towards goal three, which is good health and well-being for all. Looking at some sanitation figures from the World Health Organization, and these were published in 2019, but are actually based on data from 2017. These show that back in 2017, 45% of the global population, so that was about 3.4 billion people, were able to use a safely managed sanitation service. 31% of the global population, 2.4 billion people were able to use private sanitation facilities, whilst only 14% of the global population, so 1 billion people, were actually able to use toilets or latrines where excretion was disposed within situ. 74% of the world's population, so that was 5.5 billion people, used at least a basic sanitation service. With 2.0 billion people still not having access to basic sanitation facilities such as toilets or latrines and of those 673 million still defecate in the open for example in street gutters behind bushes or into open bodies of water. So I think when we look at those figures there are some huge concerns over the large number of those. And we can think, certainly if we're sat in the UK, that they apply very much to those low and middle income countries. But actually, I think it's interesting to look at things over time. And actually here in the UK, sanitation and toileting has changed and evolved so much over the last hundred years. Okay, so the photo in the top um, left hand corner is a little bit more than 100 years, that's photos of Roman toilets which are actually very sophisticated. But what we can see is that actually right from the turn of the 20th century we were still using chamber pots and when toilets were starting to be installed they were often outdoors and outdoor toilets are still a thing here in the UK. Even 15 years ago when I bought my first home in the UK there was an outside toilet. Thankfully there was one indoors as well, but you know we still see outdoor toilets. Many modern toilets have moved to wall hung toilets and interestingly as we've gone to glamping and more people have got used talking about climate, we're seeing an increase and in more awareness of compost um, toilets and going back to sort of nature. Looking at sanitation, and these figures come from the United Nations. Sanitation is about a well-functioning toilet connected to a sanitation system that takes away and deals with human waste. We know that billions of people live with weak and vulnerable sanitation systems, or in some cases, no systems at all. Climate change will disrupt, disrupt or destroy sanitation services for huge numbers of people if we don't start acting now. And flooding, drought, rising sea levels can damage any part of this sanitation system. Toilets, pipes, tanks and treatment plants spreading raw sewage and creating a public health emergency. And I think even in the UK, we can't deny that these climate changes are impacting our lives now. In recent years, across our nations, we've experienced more and more severe floods, as the photos here show. And we hear of the risks of raw sewage and poor drainage that people are experiencing as part of this flooding. Sanitation and the spread of disease. In least developed countries, 22% of healthcare facilities have no water services. 21% have no sanitation services. And 22% no waste management. 
again, we're looking probably there, as we say, at least developed countries. But globally, according to the World Health Organization, globally, 15% of patients develop an infection during a hospital stay. And okay, with the proportion being much greater in low income countries, we can't ignore that there is a percentage here in the UK. And I think this year in particular, as we've seen COVID-19, we've seen here in the UK and the world that everyone must have substantial sanitation alongside clean water and hand washing facilities to help protect and maintain our health security and stop the spread of deadly infectious diseases. I think it'll be a long time and hopefully before we forget Boris washing his hands to sing in happy birthday. But that real key need for keeping sustainable sanitation at every part in every country. So starting to look at this with a bit of our occupational therapy lens, what are the benefits of improved sanitation. Some of the benefits are re reducing the spread of disease, as we've really seen with COVID-19 in the last few months. But we see reducing the severity and impact of malnutrition, promoting dignity and boosting safety, particularly among women and girls, and promoting school attendance. And it's shown that girls' school attendance is particularly boosted by the provision of separate sanitary facilities. And that might be something we take for granted within the UK, but worldwide it isn't. A World Health Organization study back in 2012 calculated that for every $1 invested in sanitation, there was a return of $5.5 in lower health costs, more productivity, and fewer premature deaths. And I think as occupational therapists, what that really brings to heart, isn't it, is that improving sanitation is actually also about promoting participation in daily activities in life. So keeping that occupational therapy lens, I want to revisit occupational science and start to review our understanding of occupational science. So occupational science is the academic study of occupation, recognising its complexity and also the experience of occupations. Occupational science was established by occupational therapists and colleagues from related disciplines under the leadership of Dr Elizabeth Yerkser back in the late 1980s. And it was to generate knowledge about human occupation. It studies the things that people do in their everyday lives and how those occupations influence and are influenced by health. Not just by health, but also well-being and their environments. Occupational science provides a way of thinking that enables an understanding of occupation, the occupational nature of humans and the relationship between occupation, health and well-being. One of the first approaches was about using and studying the form, function and meaning of occupation. I'm just going to take a little bit of time to look at those in more detail. So when we're looking at the form of an occupation, this is how something is done. It refers directly to the observable aspects of occupation. For example, occupational scientists may compare how different cultures or social groups perform an occupation. And we know with toileting that there are huge differences around the world and with cultures. I can still remember quite vividly my first holiday to France as a child and being quite amused by the B-Day. I can remember how bathroom designs in the UK in the 1980s evolved and B-Days started appearing in our UK bathrooms. I do still wonder how many were actually still used as they were intended. Some of the other photos show squat toilets which are very familiar in parts of Africa and Asia. We have long drops and many toilets outside and away from the main population areas of villages. And we also know that other cultures, so the Chinese and Japanese, have probably what we've envisaged as more complex toilets throughout their years. 
um, where we have the buttons. Um, I think one of my first lessons I learned when I was in China, certainly when the um, instructions weren't in pictures or in English, was to make sure that the toilet seat was down before pressing any indirect button. The larger photo on the right shows a typical Filipino toilet. The one in circles in yellow shows a tube for a temperature shower and the one in red shows what the Filipinos call a bidet. Filipino toilets, there you can see the bucket and a pail there, often have this pail and dipper. And these are used for cleaning the self after toileting or taking a bath, so giving ourselves a final rinse. That dipper in Filipino is referred to as a taboo. And I think as we progress, it's how people also use the toilet. I know Kate has done previous um, webinars in these series around that toileting is not just about the function of relieving ourselves. People go to the toilet and spend time there reading or just getting away from the children. So there are lots of cultural differences in how we use the toilets around the world. If we look at function and types of occupation, the function refers to the contributions of an occupation to human development. It looks at choice and the time we spend doing activities. So occupations can be very grossly sort of separated into different things, looking at the time we spend doing them. So occupations might be necessary, so referring to time that is needed to satisfy basic physiological needs. It encompasses things like sleep as well as toileting, meals and health. We often argue that these activities take first priority and often don't involve much choice. Contracted occupations are those that refer to regular paid work or school and education. They allow a degree of freedom of choice for some but not always and they are times where we spend longer and have structure over our other daily activities. Committed time to occupations cover a great variety of activities with all certain traits. So these are often committed to do certain activities simply because we chose earlier things, such as getting married, buying a house, having children, buying a car, perhaps a motorhome. All those occupations have consequences and bring around different roles. And then other occupations have free time. When we're looking at toileting or bathing, they often fall into the necessary sort of physiological needs, but also sometimes that free time. We know that occupations encompass a diversity of actions carried out in a given context. We also know as occupational therapists that occupations develop and evolve over a person's lifetime. As children, as parents, you know, that use of a potty, maybe, you know, that enjoyment for the child of getting it right, getting the praise from the parents. Parents often making potty time and toilet training into something as a game. As we grow older, toileting is maybe not so much a game or an enjoyment. It's maybe something, if we're lucky, that we do without thinking. But then as we start to age, we maybe spend more time thinking about it, thinking about where, where will the next toilet be? You know, do I go upstairs? Do I need to go upstairs? Do I need to plan time to get to the toilet? Yeah. In our household, we always call it doing a granddad. And that's that classic example of everybody's ready to leave the house. And then somebody says, oh, just need to go to the toilet before we leave. And all those thoughts around not actually sitting on the toilet, but all that preparation of how we get there and what that means to us. The meaning of an occupation, and that refers to the subjective experience of participating in an occupation, and also how that's constructed symbolically within a culture. Again, we know that there are differences culturally. Here we have a picture of a Japanese bath, which is much more of a social um, 
aspect and more public baths where you, you go to a public bath. Whereas here, maybe in the UK, it's about relaxation and being on our own. There are many cultures that find our experience of bathing in the UK quite, quite strange, of sitting in what's perceived as dirty water for a large amount of time. So all that takes us to thinking about occupational justice. And this is a term and a concept very embedded within occupational science. Wilcock and Townsend describe it as the right of every individual to be able to meet basic needs and to have equal opportunities and life chances to reach towards her or his potential, but specific to the individual's engagement in diverse and meaningful occupation. As occupational therapists, we believe that individuals have occupational rights. Within the terms of occupational science and whilst looking at occupational justice, we then have to look at what happens if that's not possible. So what are the outcomes of occupational injustice? And there are a number of terms that describe different types of occupational injustice. So we have occupational alienation, which is a separation from usual, meaningful, purposeful and valued occupations that would otherwise provide a sense of belonging, power, control and fulfilment. Occupational marginalisation, which is exclusion from participation in valued occupations due to environmental forces, such as societal expectations, implicit or explicit discrimination, or dominant political or economic systems. And if we think back to some of those earlier facts and figures from the World Health Organization and the United Nations about people having access to toilets and certainly looking at participation of women and girls, we often see that those groups are marginalized, maybe by societal and political factors that prevent them from toileting safely. The term occupational imbalance suggests that humans need variation in occupations for health and well-being at a societal level, where some are offered lots of opportunities for occupation and others have fewer opportunities. Um, and that imbalance impacts on our health and well-being, but also how we participate in society as a whole. Two other terms are around occupational deprivation a state of prolonged preclusion from engagement in occupations of necessity and or meaning due to factors which stand outside the control of the individual. So again, that could refer to those school age girls that aren't able to go to school because there aren't safe toilet and things. Or we hear of stories of displaced persons or um, in low-income countries where toilets are not um, private and, and girls and women being at risk for using those facilities. Occupational disruption is a transient or temporary condition of being restricted from participation in necessary or meaningful occupations, such as that caused by illness, temporary relocation or temporary employment. So obviously, as occupational therapists, we can argue that lack of sanitation and or inability or difficulties in toileting can lead to all these concepts of occupational injustice, especially occupational marginalisation, occupational deprivation and occupational disruption, whereby someone stops doing something or is unable to do something either because they don't feel clean and don't want to leave their house, or even because they can't use the toilets when they're out and about in society. And that is a form of occupational injustice. Stephen asked at the start about awareness of Change in Places campaign. And we'll look at this a number of places in the presentation. But the Change in Places campaign supports the rights of people with profound and multiple learning or other physical disabilities to access their community. 
The Change in Places toilet is a fully accessible toilet with the following additional equipment. A height adjustable changing bench, a overhead track or mobile host, a peninsula toilet, privacy screen and enough space for up to two carers as detailed in the British standards. Now at first sight we can say is that occupational justice? The aim behind changing places of supporting those rights, allowing access to the community and allowing people to engage in their community can be seen as that. Although we can argue that whilst it's not fully legal and it's not in the law that it has to be compulsory, is it full occupational justice? It won't be until 2021, and this is in England, Will it be compulsory for new buildings to look at the regulations around changing places? So I think that there's still a long way to go to that being fully occupationally just. But it's a good start and something as occupational therapists we should be getting behind and helping promote. The whole idea of environment and universal design is not new to us as occupational therapists. Universal design is the process of creating products that are accessible to people with a wide range of abilities and disabilities. Typically products are designed to make the most suitable for the average user and we see examples of this and we know as occupational therapists that universal design is about access to enabling participation, not just in the necessary specific activity, but the aspect of social participation as well. The picture on the left shows is from a project that I was involved in back in the early 2000s, which was looking at access to water for communities in low income countries. And what this project, project and study found that whilst the design of the standpipe was important and a lot of time and design was put into making that easy to use for people with disabilities. We also looked at the access, so making sure that there was ramps leading to the standpipe um, and that the, the um, gradient and the flooring around those standpipes were conducive to people with disabilities. What was interesting with that study was that whilst yes it allowed access to the water, the outcomes and what the people participating in fed back to more was that it was actually the project enabled them to be part of their community. They were glad that they could go get access to clean water than themselves, but what they actually valued most was actually talking to other people whilst they were doing that activity and that community feel and belonging. We see bathroom designs here in the UK and around the world and if those bathroom designs are inclusive then they are much easier and enjoyable for everybody to use. Dignity and choice should be foremost of what we do in our cl clinical reasoning. Our clinical reasoning comes from talking to our patients, our clients, our service users, from listening and respecting their needs and wants alongside processing the information related to the knowledge that we have as a professional. I think one of our most valued things as an occupational therapist is how we use our interactive reasoning, how we listen to our clients and understand their feelings that they have about themselves, and the interventions and the activities and occupations that they want to do as an individual. I remember learning a very valuable lesson very early on in my days as working as an occupational therapist in Uganda and we used there something called appropriate paper technology. <clears throat> it's the top left hand, top right hand corner. Appropriate paper technology is an advanced paper mache and we made equipment out of that. Very sturdy, layers and layers of paper, paste, glue, and covered in varnish. And working with a young gentleman in his early 20s, where his only toilet was outside, and it was a squat toilet, 
he had reduced mobility and lots of issues with balance. And it was about that clinical reasoning, it was about talking to him and listening to him. He so wanted and needed for his dignity to be able to use the toilet independently. And the only way we could look to do that was by using paper technology. My initial thoughts, having come recently from the UK, was about hygiene and cleanliness and the paper getting soggy and dirty. But actually, that was not his concerns at all. And by bringing his choice and enabling his occupational choices and using a commode seat made with paper technology, we were enabled to allow him his dignity in toileting independently. I think as occupational therapists here in the UK, and as we look at toileting, we're so used to looking at the good old toilet seat and the heights of toilets. Something that we must argue more for and talk about more is toileting as a whole around dignity. And also about that cleanliness. How do people wash and dry? What do people want from their toilet? So finishing off for my part is just taking us back to toileting and sanitation as a basic human right. The World Federation of Occupational Therapists state that occupational therapists around the world are obligated to promote occupational rights as the actualization of human rights. Protecting people's occupational rights to participate in health giving range of occupations by choosing occupations that are meaningful to them and freely engage in necessary and chosen occupations. And that's the foundation of just and inclusive societies. Abuses of occupational rights are abuses of human rights and as such abuses undermine occupational justice. An occupational just society enables participation in both necessary and meaningful occupations which contribute to health and well-being. As occupational therapists, we can see toileting as a unique occupation in itself. We can see toileting as part of a more complex occupation such as getting ready for school or getting for work. But as occupational therapists, it's important that we support our clients to participate in meaningful occupations, which include toileting, enabling them to flourish and be included and valued members of our society. So that brings me to the end of what I wanted to say. I'll join Kate on the questions and answers, but I will also refer on to Robin. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Really insightful stuff there. Okay, um, thanks again, Sam. Um, so yeah, my name's Robin. I'm marketing manager for Closmat. Uh, I've been with Closmat now for 15, just 15 and a half years, uh, uh, so quite a while. Um, I'll take you through our presentation now, um, just to talk a little bit about Closomat. Um, just bear with me, slide move up. Uh, Sam mentioned about changing places, so I just wanted to dip into this a little bit more really. Um, a lot of you'll know that we are the, uh, uh, the, the leading supplier of wash dry toilets, but, but actually um, we're also um, one of the leading um, uh, people in the supply and fit of uh, changing places uh, facilities. We've been involved with it since 2007 actually uh, and I, I myself was quite instrumental in bringing that to the business and actually moving that forward in terms of promotion as well. We, we did a lot at the very beginning with it. Um, changing places to occupational therapists is an odd one for me, odd really because you know it's, it's sort of the end thing but as, as OTs I think you'll recognise the fact that um, your role doesn't just begin and end in, in the home or even in just in the school or what have you, um, but actually much further into the wider life of your clients. Um, and, and changing places allows people to go out and do, as Sam said, you know, be participants in the world. Um, so really, I just wanted to say, you know, um, changeplaces-org uh, site there is the one where 
you can go and actually look on that website. It's not the best website in the world, but it's great for identifying where change of places are in, in local areas uh, for people to go out. Um, and, and something that Kate mentioned, which is a really good point actually, uh, privately to me, was that change of places facilities allows for product training and product awareness with your clients. So actually going to a public venue where you can meet, not necessarily in this current climate, but uh, when we can. Um, and it's great. And as you can see from the image, you know, there's lots of things to actually look at. So we can discuss with people what, what a hoist is um, and understand what space is required for a hoist, what space is required for a changing bed, um, a toilet, uh, whether it be a wash dryer or a conventional, um, just to let you know that in the uh, latest iteration of the uh, uh, change of place regs, um, it does recommend, although isn't a must, but it does recommend that a wash dry toilet's included. And actually, if we think about it, it does provide a lot more of a holistic approach to, to the uh, independent toileting or assisted toileting, depending on the level of disability, to have the, the wash dry toilet in there. Um, so um, if anybody needs, wants to recommend, gets involved with, we can be on hand to provide lots of information about changing places. We've installed hundreds across the UK over the last, yeah, 10 years, uh, more really. Um, so if, if anybody wants any further information, they can get it from our website and also contact us directly as well. So what do we do? Um, we do the wash dry toilet as, as, as most people will know that, um, but we do the change in places and that also is the hygiene room as well. So it's basically in essence a change of places facility, um, but in a educational setting, i.e. A, a hygiene room, that's what it's called. Um, we do the um, high trustable um, shower seats, um, uh, chairs, uh, changing benches, high adjustable wash hand basins, drop down rails, um, body dryers, and also overhead hoisting systems as well. Specifically speaking about the thing we manufacture here in the UK, and that's the, uh, the, the Palmer Vita and also its wall hung sister, the Lima Vita. Um, features and benefits, well, it is the, the UK's leading number one wash dry toilet. Um, and it is that for multiple reasons. And one of those reasons is the effective wash and dry performance that it, that it brings with it. Uh, that's an eight litre per minute um, wash function. So it's a nice short um, blast, but effective uh, wash dowsing. Um, it's very versatile. Um, it's versatile in terms of its installation um, because of the way that we've designed it um, specifically for um, disabled people in the UK and in Europe. And so we've designed it to be easy to install, but also adaptable as well. So we can make this toilet the point of order or retrospectively, we can bring it back to the client's needs, um, whether that's the fitting of arms, whether that there's lots of boxing in the, in, in the, in the toilet area, the washroom area, we can, we can fit it in almost every situation, including underfloor heating. Um, it's very easy to use, it's push and go technology. So one push flushes, washes and dries. That's one push, just does it all. There's not, no need for pressing of one button for this and one button for that and another for another. It's one and it does everything. It's hands-free if you want it to be. Has a, a safe working load of up to 30 stone. But if we uh, add a big John seat to it, and um, we can elevate that, um, not just the, the, the slightly bigger seating area, but the actual safe working load up to 57 stone. So we do have a lot of bases covered. And um, there's lots of pediatric equipment that can be used with it as well, right at the other end. Palm Alive, something that, that Stephen very briefly mentioned at the beginning. So this is a, uh, uh, the Palm or other Lima with a 10 year service and warranty package all built into one cost. So it sits on one line on the quote. We have a range of uh, product specialists based throughout the whole of the UK, covering everywhere in, in, in the UK. We really want to just reiterate our processes that, that we have in place to work with you guys as, as healthcare professionals. Um, we want to take responsibility with you for how, how, how the, thing, the products get specified. So we've got client assessment, which I'll touch on in a minute product specification demonstration um typically at the moment that'd be remote demonstration or virtual demonstration 
Um, but we also want to get the installation survey correctly from a construction design management point of view, which is obviously a legal requirement. And as long as you guys work with us, and I'll touch on this more, we want to you know, guarantee what gets specced, no quibble goes in. <clears throat> so from surveys um, point of view, um, it, it, they can be very complicated, but they can be also very simple. Um, no two surveys are the same. Um, but in this current climate at the moment, obviously we're having to, you know, work smart and, and, and make sure that everything's covered, um, COVID, etc. So we've carried out rigorous uh, risk assessments. We've documented them all. They're all available on our um, on our website under the uh, uh, on the homepage under the about key. Um, if we do go to site, we will respect the two meter distancing at all time. We can we can wear PPE. Um, not a problem. Um, but first and foremost, I think we would look to do a remote assessment. So the remote assessment is really quite simple. So you guys in the normal way would get in touch. We'd have a conversation about what was what, what, what the situation was. Um, we then speak to somebody in the residence, whether that be a carer, the client themselves, or, or somebody else that would be teed up for the assessment. Um, we'd go through the call, which includes an online questionnaire, and it's all to do with um, making sure everything is is safe to, to, to proceed to the next stage, which is the actual assessment call itself. Following that call, which could be done using a smartphone or an iPad or something of that nature, something video that we can we can basically comply with the CDM regs and we can look at everything and, and bring into account all the specification requirements of the, of the client and also anything that you guys need from your point of view. And once that's fed back into the office and we'll generate the quotation and that comes out to you and that process because you've been with us the whole the whole way through and and sometimes things change or mistakes happen whatever it might be but with our no quibble guarantee not the catchiest of titles but what it what it basically does is is locks us into our commitment to you we will get it right Something else that we've been refining during the time that we've we've been able to do so is um, virtual team meetings. We've always been really successful with team meetings with you guys and, and coming out and uh, meeting with groups of you, uh, your place or in a neutral environment, or even bringing you over to to, to our showroom, um, which we no longer obviously can can do that, um, but we can still do them virtually. So virtual team meetings. Um, really important actually and we've, we've done a number over the last few months um, uh, online using Zoom technology or Teams um, like this um, and it's CPD qualified so you get your certificate at the end of it and we cover all sorts I mean there's just a couple of things actually that are in there but we, we try and make these as bespoke as we can for you guys so again you speak to one of our product specialists you probably all know who your local one is but if not um, you can put it in the chat or, or, or look on our website again, the About Us part, and um, contact them and have a conversation. It, it, um, it might be, as, as one of my colleagues recently had, they really wanted to get into the nitty gritty of installation and how, how versatile actually is the Palmer in, in installing it. And they really wanted to get into that. They knew the product, they knew the spec, they knew about the flow rates and that sort of thing and the accessories, but they really wanted to get from a more technical point of view, and we're geared up for that, absolutely. So we can just tailor that package to you and um, get it out there and, and go through it with you in a, in a safe way, virtually. So additionally, we've got Palmer Life, Re still reasonably new uh, as a product to, to us, but the uptake's been fantastic. And this was designed uh, in conjunction um, with um, local authority people and occupational therapists that basically doesn't split the product and the servicing separately. It, it packages it all into one go. It's fit and forget. No comebacks, no hassles, no surprises. It's basically the product with the cover in one package on one line can be included in the DFG and just go straight through and you fit it there's no messing around, it becomes our responsibility and we will liaise with the client for the remainder of that product's service life. So, as the slide says, taking responsibility for the welfare of your clients, warranty and service. Again, it's, it's about 
you know, you, you, you get your car, you have it serviced every year, um, but you don't necessarily take out the extended warranty. So warranty is great, but it's it's sort of in with that that product. And ours comes with the 12, 12, 12 month warranty. Um, but a service and a warranty are very different. And like with your car, you you wouldn't um, you wouldn't um, you know uh, buy a, a new car and just rely on the warranty when when the servicing actually provides a proactive. Uh, nature to the, the product it extends that product's life and um, you know it's it's a protection as we've said there in the investment um, it's all it's all back to us it protects the grant funding it protects the end user they don't have to pay anything if it's gone through the grant system and we just take control and responsibility for it you've sorted out at the front end with us under no quibble we go 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 in there and uh, do the servicing the maintenance any adjustments it's really that simple we don't want it to be complicated we just want it to be ring us up we go through the covid checklist we go out we sort it out for them it's, it really is that simple so as i mentioned we do change in places but we can do all of those um, pieces of equipment back into the domestic setting as well um, whether that be a, a shared residence a group home or whether it is just a single um, occupancy dwelling um, we do overhead hoisting systems we actually supply the um, hill rom leco rail hoisting systems um, which in my opinion are just absolutely the best um, and the also the press lit height adjustable equipment again very very robust very good kit um, and works um, but we've put them those particular ones in there because uh, they're the ones we specify quite often but but there are varying different options available for each of those pieces of equipment okay thank you for your time i'm going to hand over to uh, Stephen now our head of marketing thank you robin that was really uh, insightful as always and also uh, thanks to sam as well for her uh, her presentation both very uh, very insightful as I said. Um, before I sort of close, um, I'd like to just sort of, um, Robin, if you just move it on a quick slide, that would be great. Um, or maybe I can, thank you. Just a little recap on the learnings for today. I know from your perspective, it's useful from a CPD perspective. Um, Sam went through reflecting on toileting and sanitation at a global level, considered how toilets protect our health and well-being and spent a, a, a deal of time exploring and understanding the occupational science in relation to clinical reasoning. So um, hopefully uh, that's been a really helpful session for everybody today. What I wanted to do now is to open it out to the floor. Um, we've also, as I said, we've got Kate from the OT service available um, on chat, and I know she's been frantically typing away um, the answers to a number of questions that you've had. Uh, we've also got Robin, and Sam, Robin from Closima, as you know, and Sam, as you know, from the OT service for any Q&A and uh, questions. So um, first of all, I suppose if I go to you, Kate, are there any um, any outstanding sort of questions um, that you may want to? There's, there's one that's literally just come through from Suzanne, which says, what would you say are the benefits of a wash dry toilet over the versions that can be attached to an existing domestic toilet? Um, from my perspective, it's about assessment and what is best for an individual. I think like any occupational therapist, you'd look at all the options open to you. But a wash dry toilet, if you've got somebody who's doing side transfers, um, is far more robust and lasts a lot longer. Um, also what you find with a fixed wash dry toilet is that you often have better options to bespoke for an individual um, you can get the height right so if you're adding something to the height of a toilet like a bidet toilet you have to look at the height in relation to say the wheelchair transfer so i think it's um it gives you a better long-term solution for an individual person however to be fair, I have used bidet toilets. Um, I use them a lot for uh, rental properties where we can't get permission to um, change the toilet. Okay. And then the other question that came up about changing places, and I know Robin did mention it, um, 
But changing places are a great place to do assessments. And I have taken people to changing places. Um, Newport Pagnell service station on the M1 for one, uh, where somebody wanted to physically try how it felt to use it. Um, and sometimes it's really important to actually defecate and clean yourself and see how it works. Um, and it, it meant that we were putting in a piece of equipment that, that the client felt confident about using. But also what it did was just explain why we were making the bathroom as big as we were, because he had to have an assisted transfer. Uh, and it made it very clear in his mind why we had done what we had done. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks. Are there any other outstanding ones? I, I appreciate we're kind of running out of time, but are there any others in the chat that, I know there's a couple in Q&A now. Um, I can't see them, but if there's anything in there that uh, needs following up, then uh, we could certainly do that now. Um, what I would say to everybody, if there are outstanding chats or Q&A that we've not been able to cover today, we do pick them up and, um, and we will try and answer those after the session's finished. I can I can just answer a couple of those if, if I can. Um, Sarah Ashworth is asking, um, why do we no longer provide the height adjustable Lima toilet? Um, that's the Lima lifter. Um, I think it was more to do with um, demand really. If I'm right there, Stephen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, very, very few demand and, and uh, an expensive product to manufacture and, and um, get out there. So that's just, yeah, supply and demand issue, really. Um, any change in places, Scottish borders? Do we have any uh, in Scotland? Yeah, um, actually the joint um, owners of the campaign, uh, PAMIS, um, massive advocates for, for changing places. Actually, they're probably leading the way with it, if I'm being really honest. Um, so, yeah, if you go um, to um, changing-places.org, you can actually check out all the locations where they are. Um, Well, somebody just to let you know, somebody said the website wasn't working. So, if you've got any contacts, could you contact? Yeah, them? yeah, yeah, yeah. We can do. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. Um, Cognitive uh, difficulties with the shock of the first use of the wash dry toilet. Um, no, it 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 is a sh well. It <laughs> I think everybody's different, really. Um, I know the first time I used it, you're expecting it, um, but you know, um, maybe Kate and Sam might jump in here as to different assessments that they've done with people, maybe with learning uh, disabilities. I, I'm, you know, that, that is an issue. Um, um, I, I know I was involved with somebody who, who was scared about that first time that that person would be using it. Um, I think I, it's all about preparation. And yeah. From my perspective, it's about actually being able to discuss intimate details of your bodily functions uh, and to be able to explain that you know once you've defecated you can press a button and water and often with um, clients with learning difficulties in the difficulties in the past uh, we we've kind of prepared them for the feeling with their carers with actually using a douche or a water or you can get um, portable uh, bidet um, equipment now so you can prepare people a little bit more for what it's going to feel like um, the problem is when you do try it for the first time um, and having used them a number of times now um, there is an element of shock even though you 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 know that it's coming uh, but it decreases with the amount of time that you use it Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I think from a time perspective, we'll um, we'll leave it there. Um, I think from what I would like to say is a big thank you to to Robin and Sam for presenting today, and also for Kate for, as I said, frantically typing away for the last hour or so. Um, we are planning one more webinar between now and Christmas, so it would be great to see um, all of you back on that um, that webinar. If not, then um, it's a big thank you from everybody at Closamat. For, for your continued support over what's been a really um, tough year for everyone in 2020. Um, 
what I will say is CPD certificates will be with everyone that's attended today before the end of today I know the last one took a little while to get to you for various issues around um, firewalls etc the content of video will follow what I would say um, for people and I know we've had a number of people post these webinars subscribing if you subscribe to our YouTube channel then you get an automated um, notification when there's a new video or a new webinar video available so that's really straightforward just go on to uh, Closomat's YouTube channel and subscribe and you'll get all um, any new uh, CPD content sent straight to you in terms of notifications it's a lot easier than waiting for emails um, so that was really it for uh, for me and the team today uh, just finally just to say um, thanks again to everybody for attending and, uh, and do stay safe out there and we hope to see you on subsequent webinars this year or into the new year so thank you thanks bye, -bye.